want to humble ourselves before you right now. You are altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to us. And we are humbled to be in your presence. We thank you for your incredible love for us. We thank you for this group of people that we can sing together as one body with one voice to you, lifting you up. Be with us right now, God, as we open up your word. God, please prime our hearts, our minds, our bodies, our souls, our spirits to hear what you want to say to us today. We pray all this in your name. Amen. 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 Good morning, everybody. Great to be together today. And uh, you might look around and, and not see some of the people you normally see, although it is quite full in here right now. Wow. The Northwest community is actually having their own service at KSU with the North Campus. South Campus having their own service as well. But uh, we are here together continuing our series that we started last week called To Serve One Another in Love. And Nick did an amazing job last week. If you haven't listened to that sermon by Nick last week, please go back and listen to it. Uh, Nick did a fantastic job. Just appreciate him bringing us to the very feet of Jesus and, and letting us know that we serve a God who wants to serve us and how amazing it is when Jesus is, is really telling his disciples through different parables, like, you got to be ready when the master comes back. But when the master comes back, he wants to serve the servants. And that's the kind of God that we serve. And it all starts there. And this amazing scene that Nick took us through where Jesus goes to his disciples. This is the author of life. This is our Lord, our Savior, our King of Kings, and he stoops down and washes their feet, doing something so humiliating. I mean, slaves would do this. Peter's just like, no, 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 no. I'm not going to let you do this, Jesus. You're our master. You're my rabbi. How could I possibly let you do something like this? And Jesus says, look, unless I wash you, Peter, you have no part with me. In other words, if we're going to be in relationship to each other, you have to let me serve you. You have to let this happen. And then by extension, he says, if you see me doing this for you, then you need to go and do this for each other. And so this whole idea of serving together is contingent on the fact that we recognize just how amazingly loving and generous and sacrificial our God is for us. And it's like when they approach Jesus and they say, Jesus, what's the greatest command? They didn't ask him for two commands. They asked him for the first and greatest command, but he gives them two. Because he says, the first one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, but I gotta give you the second one too. To love your neighbor as yourself because it's just like it. It is so bound together. And so when we think about our life as we follow Jesus, if we follow, call ourselves disciples of his, then we have to be all about having a culture of community. And that's what we're going to be talking about, a culture of community. And when you look at the New Testament and you see just what is all about with the, with the early Christians and how are they trying to be together? How are they trying to have relationships? Over and over again, we see this image. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Over and over again, the metaphor that God uses through the biblical authors trying to communicate what kind of connections we should have over and over again, it is the human body. That this is what's supposed to describe how we interact together, how close we are, and how bonded we are together. And isn't the human body just absolutely incredible? I mean, the more we learn, 
the more we discover about all the different functions, all the different things that work together from organs to organ systems, your skeletal, muscular, neural pathways, digestive, cardiovascular, all these different things, just so that one thing can happen. You can't even count the number of things for me to speak these sentences, for you to hear these sentences. It's just crazy. And it's amazing how everything is working together. And that's supposed to be us in the church. That if I decide I want to be a Christian, that I refuse to go at life alone. I refuse to be a solo Christian. There's no such thing. And I choose to inseparably bond myself to you and you and you, just like my arm is inseparably bound to my shoulder. I mean, that is intense. And that's what God wants for us. And when you look just at the very beginning to see how important is this to God, you have to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. This idea that, you know, Jordan did a great job talking about how our life, our identity needs to be defined by the fact that we're created in the image of God. But oftentimes, like, what does that mean? Sometimes it's a little difficult to, to really put into words, like, what is that? does that mean we look like him? Like, he created us in the physical sense to look like him, but we don't see him, so what's that about? Is it that he gave us reason and discernment and intellect? Like, that's the, the mark of, of image. And I was talking to Jeff Hickman. He, he's doing his master's in divinity, uh, taking theological courses. They talked about this that you actually get a clue into what image of God really means in this passage. When it says that he created them male and female as two distinct and diverse parts working together. That this is what it means because God himself exists in community. God exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so when he creates us in his image, he creates us in community. So the idea of being bonded and paired together or grouped together is just as much a part of being human as anything else. This is God's will for us. And then you look at history, you look at early humanity, the idea of being community has always been there. Whether you're talking about cities or towns or villages, even just hunter-gatherers. The idea is, look, I have skills and resources, and you have skills and resources that are different from mine. And if we're going to make it in this world, we have to work together. Like, I can't do this by myself. we got to survive out here. There's wild animals trying to kill us. There's people trying to take our stuff. Like, i got to have your back, and you got to have my back. I don't know how to do everything. You know, I, I, I'll be the farmer, you be the hunter, you be the baker, you be the butcher. We'll do this together. This is the only way that civilization is going to work. And I think we all long for that as humans, but do we always feel that way? Do we always live that way? And do we ever approach the church apart from this? When we think about being so closely bonded that I need you and you need me. And, and this, this whole idea is so beautifully encapsulated in this passage in Acts chapter 4. When Christians, when followers of Jesus decide, yes, we want to exist together in community this way, this is what it looks like. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own. All right, hold on a second. Did, they, did he just contradict himself a little bit? Like, they had their possessions but they said, it's not my possession. And you think about it like, no, that's mine. That's just basic human like, operation. Yeah, that's mine. That, that's my lawn. Please get off my lawn. Don't park your car. That's my side of the street right there. No, no, that, that's actually my sandwich. All right. Get, in fact, my son did this last night. He just like, no, James, that's my sandwich. You got your pizza over there. Like, let's keep this distinct. This is mine. And you start to sound like a kid when you, when you talk like that. But we think like that. And when you're young, you have to learn that, yes, I have things, they have things, and there's a difference. I'm an individual. But I think God wants to grow us to grow out of that a little bit. It says, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. 
For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Some of us have been Christians for a long time. We've read this passage. Some of you might be new to Christianity. This is crazy. The idea that you share everything that you have and what I have is yours. Like, it's not even a thing that I have. No, 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 you take it. I, I heard this amazing story, one of the most encouraging stories that I have ever heard in my entire life just last week. Some of you might know a brother. His name is Lee Laguerre. He moved here from Miami just a couple months ago to help in the campus ministry. And when he got here, he didn't have a car. And he's working down at Georgia State, coming to Marietta, going back and forth. It is hard to live in Atlanta without a car. Can I get an amen to that? It's, it's really hard. And so people are talking, you know, disciples in the church, you know, what can we do? And there is a family, and I'm not going to say who it is because more treasure in heaven for them, but they had a car. And they were looking to sell this car. I think the Kelly Blue Book value was like five grand. And they gave that car to Lee for free. Yes, absolutely. And Lee is, Lee is telling us this story, and he's like, guys, I, I couldn't believe it. it was too good to be true. We we're doing this bill of sale, and they write zero. And they, they give me this car. We do all the paperwork. It's all legit. And I'm just driving away, and like, how is this happening right now? Like, how is this possible? Because this is so contrary to our culture today, isn't it? I mean, $5,000, like, you could do a lot with that. We have improvements that we want to make to our house. Like, come on, like, let's use that money. It's like, no, just take it. It's incredible when you think about it. It's this idea of thinking communally rather than individually. And I think it's important we understand we are individuals. There's nothing wrong with that. God created us unique with special rights and talents and privileges, all these different things. But that's not the full picture of how God created us to live and to thrive as his people. And I think oftentimes we just think so much individualistically and we need to move on. We need to think, not move on totally, but we need to engage more with this whole idea of communal living. And we talked about winning the war in your mind in the spring. This is something that we need to win in terms of a battle in our mind to not always think individualistically. Because we are absolutely swimming in individualism. We're going to talk about it. And even just coming out off of deconstruction. You know, I think oftentimes man, we need to realize that this individualism affects our faith in great ways. And we need to deconstruct individualist Christianity. Because this is the world that we live in. Where we are constantly thinking, because of companies and advertising, all, all this stuff, that the world exists around me because I am a consumer. I get to consume and receive all of these wonderful things. There's so many options. If I need something or I want something, I can have it. And we just go on operating in that way. I mean, and constantly being bombarded <laughs> with these messages that, like, you need this. You want this. You can have this. If you don't have money, go into debt. No big deal, because you need this. <laughs> and you don't have to be in Times Square. <laughs> you don't have to be in Times Square to be bombarded by these things. The research is showing that the average person sees between 4,000 and 10,000 ads, not per month, not per week, but yeah, some of you are already saying it, per day. So you have to, if I'm going to walk out of my house, I, the enemy is going to be, as I'm driving down the road, as I'm listening to whatever, I am going to be affected by these things if I'm not conscious of this society. And the crazy thing is, you don't have to walk out of your house, do you? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, we have the accessibility that we've never had before. I want that thing. I can have it in two days. If you don't give me that thing in two days, I will write an email. <laughs> I... You bet, like, come on, two days, it's guaranteed, man. That's why I subscribe to you. <laughs> but unless, Amazon is not Satan. You know what I'm saying? Online shopping is not a sin. We can use these things in a healthy way, in a good way, but we do need to realize that they can be problematic. Because another issue that comes up 
through all of this way of thinking is that we start thinking of things in disposable terms as well. We start thinking about the world, and if I don't like this thing, I just get rid of it. I can return it, I can throw it away, I can buy another thing. There are many options. I have the money to do it, and we can just move on from thing to thing. And what that really does, unfortunately, is it affects how we approach the church. This individualist, consumerist, receiving mindset has worked its way deep into modern Western Christianity today, where you might have the tendency to go to church and think, how can I receive from this situation? I am here to be served. I am here to receive the content that you're putting out. I am here to have my personal worship experience. And you offer relationships, that's great. I'll try it for a while. If those relationships don't work out, I can just go somewhere else. You know what I mean? No big deal. There's a lot of churches. I passed 20 churches on my way here. Someone is going to give me what I need and want. You know what I'm saying? We, can, we have the tendency to do that, and I fully recognize the irony of the situation that that is happening as I speak, <laughs> that this is our stage, and I'm giving you something right now. But church is not merely a 30-minute sermon, right? Church is not merely a one- or two-hour Sunday morning period of time. Church is our entire life. And in fact, in just a little bit, I'm going to get off the stage, and we're going to talk to each other. So that's coming. But yeah, in our faith life, we can get consumed with this idea of my personal relationship with God. And it's a phrase that, you know, wasn't common in, in, in years past, but in the last 70 years or so, this has become a real thing. I mean, you don't really find this idea in the Bible explicitly, but it's how we can read things. You know, even like scriptures that we love, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, for it is by grace you have been saved. And we might be thinking, yeah, Paul's saying you, he's, he's talking to me. He's talking to my personal experience as a Christian. And the problem is, it's not our fault. The English language actually has, has a problem. You guys aware of this problem? We're going to conjugate a verb today. I don't know if you expected to do that. But we, we know this. I am, you are, he or she is, we are, you are, they are. Do you see a problem with this? The, the second person plural is the same as the second person singular. And so when you address an individual, you say you. When you address a group of people, you say you. And oftentimes, we don't even realize how much we're internalizing that when we read the scriptures. But thankfully, we live in the South. And let me tell you, y'all, y'all is the greatest gift to the English language. I don't even, just like, for as long as I can remember. We need to speak like Georgians, people. No, that's not the point of the message. But when we read the scriptures, we really should be saying, as for y'all, y'all were dead in y'all's transgressions and sins. It's by grace y'all have been saved. And you, some of you might be like cringing right now. But like, the reality is the Greek is plural. Paul is talking to the Ephesian churches. He's not talking to you. He's talking to us as the believers. And you keep going like, even if it's not in the, the language explicitly, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Oftentimes we're like, Jesus died for me. And yes, that's true, but that's like a really small part of the story. He died for the whole world. We have to realize that. You know, Tom McGurk talked about this a little while ago. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, but really it's y'all's body is a temple. It's not me, it's we. And we have to constantly remind ourselves of this, many of you will realize that we have been changing the words of worship songs lately because they're great songs, but they're often written with this kind of personal, you know, swing to it. And, and we've started been saying, look, we, here we are to worship. You know, like when I'm by myself, yes, it's just me, but we are together as the assembly. Nothing wrong with these songs. I love these songs, but we have to start doing this. Actually, Michael Burns was talking about this in his teaching night a little while ago, just the importance of, like, if we don't start talking like this more as the collective, as the community, then we're going to have issues. And a phrase I hear a lot when we're talking about the church, 
what we want from the church, what we need from the church is, man, I just really want to be in a place where I can get my needs met. Like, when I think about the church, I just, I got all these needs. I really want to get my needs met. I got my family needs. I got my kids' needs. I got my Bible study needs, my worship needs. Like, I need to get my needs met. And that is true. We do have a lot of needs. And God wants to meet our needs in the church. When you think about it, if someone were to meet your need in a given moment, in that moment, they are thinking about your needs. If they were thinking about their needs, they wouldn't be meeting your needs. Yeah. Right? It seems like obvious, but maybe not. And so if we all have this mindset of I got to get my needs met, that's my concern right now, then how are any needs going to be met? And when you, when you look at this scripture, no needy persons. What a statement that is. How did that happen? Well, look, look above it, right? They were all about sharing they're all about serving. They're all about sacrificing. That was what they were all about. And I had this incredible interaction in church just a couple weeks ago, right, right here, actually. A guy came up to me, didn't know him, never met him before, and he shared with me. He was just like, I, had, I just want to thank you. And he started crying. He couldn't even speak. He couldn't even get the words out. He was so emotional because he said, during the pandemic, your live stream service was just such a lifeline. Living in Puerto Rico, not a lot of disciples. And he's like, that, was, that got me through. Thank you for the worship. And a lot of people thank me and amen. It's an honor. I appreciate the encouragement. But what I feel most strongly in those moments is to say, we have an amazing team of people. That you'll see me. You know, leading songs on a Sunday, I'm surrounded by people. Yeah. I'm surrounded by talented singers and musicians who are thinking not about what are my needs, but how can I meet other people's needs. Yeah. And they sacrifice. They get here early. They come other days of the week. They prepare by themselves at home so that when they come, they're ready to lead and serve you, to serve us. And that's just scratching the surface. I mean, they don't want me to put their pictures up here, all right, but I can't help it. A Andy and Alyssa shared last week, they do sound and, 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 and projection. Uh, Michelle runs our service. Matt does camera. We got Seth over here. We, Pete fought for live stream 10 years ago when no one thought we needed it. <laughs> because of what he did, we had it when we desperately needed it, when a lot of people didn't have it. Jamie runs lights. Carrie runs lights. Corey has joined the sound group. Moe's on the board right now. I'm, again, just scratching the surface. There's over 45 people that make up the worship and tech team. And when, yes. And when we think along these lines, when we think, man, what need can I meet today? It changes the game, 100%. And we're about to take communion together. We're going to have an interactive time. And thinking about what God has given us through Jesus, through our master who is also our servant, and the sacrifice that he went through so that we could have eternal life, so that we could have forgiveness of sins. It says that God's grace was so powerfully at work in them that there were no needy persons among them. That when we connect with God's grace in the right way, and then we engage those around us in this communal mindset, miracles can happen. Things that the world is just going to look like, be like, what? You gave someone a car for free? You're crazy. L l tell me more about that whole Jesus thing. You know, like that's the kind of impact that we can have. So what I want us to do as we take communion, we're going to take like several minutes and I want you to talk to the people around you. Two people, three people, four people, I don't really care. But I want you to ask the question, what are some needs in your life? You know, maybe it's, it's material needs, physical needs, spiritual needs. Maybe you're just going through a hard time. And, and share about those things. Maybe you're like, you know, I don't feel like I really, I can't think of any needs right now. But there are some needs of people that I know. People that I love. And let's have a discussion and engage in the way that God wants us to engage with each other. And then let's pray about it. 
So we're taking the, the, the bread that represents the body of Jesus and we form his body together. I appreciate so much Matt Ottenweller several weeks ago talking about how communion really is all about the fellowship. So let's engage, let's remember Jesus in this way and talk about these different needs and pray together. God, you are beyond words. When we think about the incredible generosity that you lavish on us every day, God, thank you for the breath in our lungs. Thank you for the heat in this building. All the things that we can so often take for granted and help us never take for granted the incredible sacrifice of Jesus. God, through his grace lavished on us, we have life to the full. We have life in you. We know that we have needs, everyone has needs, and you want to meet our needs. Help us to be your hands and feet here in the church and outside the church as we look to the community and not just to ourselves. It's in your name we pray. Amen.